Dion asked if I could present something on health economics, so to inform a non-health economic audience as to what health economics is and what health economic evaluation is. I said, fantastic, how many hours is the workshop? So let's see what we can do in 15 minutes. Um, here's me disclosures. Okay, so health economics is a very basic, conceptually it's a very basic thing. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and when we think about health, um, it's, it's an applied situation. So first of all, we need to think about what is health. So healthcare we can de define as a demand. It's a demand on the system. And the healthcare system is solely in place in order to provide better health. It's, yes, it's not rocket science. And fundamentally, like any other market, like gold, oil, um, currencies, it's just a commodity that's traded in different ways. And sort of what health economics looks to do is find ways to quantify that. So what is economics? Uh, so this is kind of a very formal definition, um, a very famous economist called Foland. Um, however, to put it very simply, economics is just the distribution of scarce resources. It's a social science that looks at the distribution of scarce resources. If you can hold on to that fundamental message, then you pretty much can hold on to what economics is. So what is health economics? So again, a quote from some very important health economists. But effectively, it's a science that's applied to the distribution of resources within the healthcare market. And there's different schools of thought. So we'll have a look at what the main health economic evaluations are, but we, we look at things in different ways. So we'll use different metrics in order to quantify what the value is and how we distribute those resources. So the reality is we could all do with being a little bit healthier. I think even those non-patients in the room, we could all be a little bit happier, maybe better psychological health, maybe a little bit more sleep. Um, because I heard there was an issue in the Crown Plaza last night that may have deprived a lot of people in the room, but all of these things do impact. But the reality is that resources are scarce. You know, we keep hearing about all these wonderful innovations. So there was some good, good results from um, the emicizumab trial. We're seeing some advancements in PK dosing, and we've got all the excitement of gene therapy on the horizon. But you know, who's going to pay for this? And that's um, because we haven't got infinite money and we haven't got infinite resources. So we've got to make choices as a society, and that's what this science tries to help us do. So we need to find ways to prioritise, and we need to understand what the costs and benefits are of a particular intervention. So the principles that underlie these, this decision-making is you know, we face trade-offs for every haemophiliac that you treat. We are very expensive patients. I think we're worth the investment, definitely, obviously. But, um, you know, try telling that to, you know, 500 patients that could get access to a different treatment individually. It's a societal trade-off, and that's the thing that we need to think about. We need to make rational decisions and that are made in the margin because... Some increments are bigger than others, and do we change healthcare systems in order to accommodate those? And people respond to incentives, so we need to be aware of how markets behave. And the reality is, this conference wouldn't be going on unless there was a big reimbursement to haemophilia. This is a rare disease conference, and I attended another rare disease conference last week. That was a blanket conference for all rare diseases. This is five times bigger because there's lots of resource invested into this area. It's, it's not rocket science, it's economics. So in terms of trying to put something into context, I won't use haemophilia because the numbers can get pretty scary and the trade-offs can get pretty scary. So thinking about a different condition, if we think about the cost of four months of renal dialysis and what that costs us as a, as a society. So this is a UK cost. And so based on the tariff in the UK, 
a renal, dia a renal dialysis patient for four months. We, you know, these, these are very real costs to society. You know, we think about free school lunches for children, which have just been removed, and um, you have cataract removals, heart bypass operation. This is what we are foregoing in order to invest in a renal dialysis patient, and haemophilia is no different. So we need to be cognizant of how the system works and how things are evaluated in order to be able to fully understand and respect what trade-off is being made. And this is kind of a mini input into this, but we also need to think about what sort of costs impact people and patients and the society as a whole. So the first two costs, so, sorry, the top cost, which is direct medical cost, is usually the thing that we look at most, particularly in haemophilia at the moment, but also lots of other conditions, whereas something that really is underserved and under-acknowledged when we think about healthcare interventions is what is the impact to society and what is the impact to a patient themselves when they leave the healthcare setting? Are they losing work? Are they losing... Um, or do they have a caregiver that's also losing productivity? And that's Mark presented earlier, and we were starting to dig into what are those softer outcomes and what are those those other things that really do impact the patient. But just to be clear, these things are not usually integrated into the HTA assessment in many countries. I think Sweden probably leads the way on that. So. In terms of health economic evaluation, so this is my life's work in about four slides, so bear with me. Um, so we, there are four main methods of health economic evaluation. The first being cost-benefit analysis. So this is kind of probably the area where I specialise in most. It's cl most closely linked to um, burden of illness or cost of disease studies. And basically, it's, ve it's a very simple, what does what is the cost versus the benefit of a particular intervention or service that's employed to treat a certain patient cohort? And that's pretty much it. And the final output is what the benefit or cost is in terms of money. If it goes into positive, it's a good investment. If it doesn't, it's pretty bad. Well, or worth it, depending on the value, which is, sorry, what we're all here to understand. Um, so the, the other one, and I think this is something that was particularly important in haemophilia. So cost minimization analysis is, it's employed when you have homogenous products in a, in, a, in a single market. So if you've got homogenous products, the most logical way to ensure that you get the most value for your public investment is to do a cost minimization analysis. In other words, who can give me their homogenous product most cheaply? This has been, hugely successful in haemophilia and particularly in the UK. However, we are not in that situation anymore. We have seen incremental progression and developments in the technology to treat haemophilia with EHLs, with novel, novel agents and gene therapy on the horizon. We need to start to employ more, uh, more complex analyses in order to ensure that we incorporate the value of an intervention as well as just what the cost is because we are not doing that at the moment in many countries. I think Ireland are leading the way on that in particular. So they've incorporated outcomes into their, um, into their tender processes. We do not do that in the UK, which is pretty shocking to be fair. And these, these more complex analyses where we can start to consider outcomes and benefits as opposed to just cost. So we have cost-effectiveness analysis, um, which effectively looks at the, the cost of the benefit gained. And the way, the, the, the dom denomination that's used in order to show this gain is usually in natural units. So in haemophilia, it might be bleeds avoided. In some treatments for a, a cardiac treatment, it might be heart attacks avoided. All of these things, it's, it's whatever the natural unit that's applicable to the disease area we, we can employ, and that would go down the cost consequence analysis route too. But we also have cost utility analysis, which Mark touched on earlier. So this is where we 
instead of looking at the natural units within the disease area, there is a common denomination which is uh, usually qualies, um, which are derived via most commonly an EQ5D, which gives us a quality of life that you can measure across all diseases, which gives us the ability to be able to look at the relative benefit across different disease areas. And that's the questionnaire. I'm sure everybody's seen one before, but just to put it into context, I'll just finish with a couple of pictures. So this is what the cost-effectiveness plan looks like. Uh, I haven't got a laser pointer, have we? Oh, I, I, I'm, you can all see. So <laughs> this is the this is the cost effectiveness plane. So we've got the on the horizontal axis, we've got the incremental costs. So if we imagine that the current standard of care is where the intersection of the two crosses is, and we've got the incremental cost going up and the incremental gain going to the right. The quality is there for illustrative purposes, but it might be heart attacks, it might be a hypoglycemic episodes, whatever it is, but this is just to illustrate. So if, we, if the treatment is better and less costly than the previous, than the current standard of care, then you fall into the bottom right of the cost effectiveness plane. So it's more beneficial and it's cheaper. And so that's good. I was challenged to try and fit Fonzie into a presentation, and I've done it. Um, so that's super cool. Um, and if the intervention goes to the top left, then it's more expensive and it's, not, it's worse than the previous treatment. Uh, Homer J says it all. I think it's, it's just not a good thing. And then this is where our arguments usually will lie. It's we can make a cost saving with a worse treatment, which is what we're doing in the UK with haemophilia treatment, probably, certainly. Um, or we could, um, or, or we can see a, benef a better treatment that might be of a higher cost. And this is where the complexity comes in and where the arguments will happen and where evidence is challenged. And that's where we are definitely going to be playing in haemophilia, which is why it's very important for us to have a fundamental understanding of what this is, but also what we need to do in order to support it from a data standpoint moving forward. So that's health economics in 15 minutes.